lot of folks out sick this morning, so let's remember our people in prayer. The Lord will give them healing mercies. Let's stand together, please, and we'll read the scripture out of our bulletin. It'll be found in 1 Kings chapter 9. I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 9 through 16. I'll read verse 9 and you respond by reading verse 10 and then I'll read verse 11 and so on as we get through. This is the word of the Lord to Elijah the prophet. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to the earth. And when they came to the of the city, behold, the little woman was there gathering the spirit. And he saw her and said, Fetch me, I have prayed him. I went to the Lord water and the vessel that I am with him. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus said the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of milk shall not waste, neither shall the fruit of oil fail, until the day that I send and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the burial of Melchizedek did not. Neither did the church of Elijah. According to the word of the Lord, she spake to Elijah. Thank you. Be seated, please. Our subject today, the title of the message is Reaching the Bottom of the Barrel. And the subject is that God tests our faith. It was a time of apostasy in the land of Israel. Elijah was a lone voice standing for God amidst all of the idolatry of the people of Israel. Elijah's name means my God is Jehovah. And Elijah had been sent to the brook Kerith. God was sort of hiding him out there. And he sends Elijah down to the brook Kerith and then he commands the ravens to feed Elijah. And I don't know exactly where the ravens got the food, but I expect that they flew down to the palace of King Ahab and as the cooks had set the warm food out on the windowsill to cool, these ravens swooped down, picked up the meat and the bread in their talons, and flew back to the brook Kerith and dropped it at the feet of Elijah. And so Elijah was fed by the ravens. You know, God is not dependent upon people. God can use ravens. He can use anything He chooses to use. However, Eventually that brook dried up. So Elijah had to move. And God instructed him as to his next move. He is to go to Zarephath. And there I have commanded, God says, a widow woman to feed thee, to sustain thee. And so Elijah obediently leaves the brook of Kerith and goes to Zarephath. As he walks into the city of Zarephath, he meets a widow woman. She's gathering some little sticks to make a little fire. And she has a handful of flour, just a little bit of oil, 
and she's going to make a little cake for her and her son. Since the famine is on in the land, people were dying of starvation. And she had reached now the last handful of flour in her flour barrel. As she scooped down the little tin can to scoop up some, off some flour, she heard a scraping sound and all she got was about a half a cup of flour. It was all, the barrel was empty. She had reached the bottom of the barrel. But Elijah had said to her, you make me a cake first, and then you and your son can eat, for the barrel of meal will not waste, nor the oil, the cruise of oil will not fail. You put me first. You make me a cake first. And then you won't have to worry. There will be a supply to last you for the three and a half years of famine. God commanded this widow woman to sustain the prophet. He commands the ravens. He commands the widows. He commands the angels. The serpents. He commands the elements of nature. Everything obeys His voice. Widows are noted for their liberality and their faith. We think of the widow Nain, whose son died and Jesus came and broke up the funeral and raised Him from the dead. Then there's the widow who went before the unjust judge and pled her case continually until the judge got so tired of it, he gave her what she was wanting. The Bible has a lot to say about widows. For example, the Bible says, Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. God has promised a special protection and a special care for widows and fatherless children. Again, in Jeremiah 49, 11, God said, Leave thy fatherless children. I will preserve them alive and let thy widows trust in me. Here again is a twofold promise to the fatherless and to the widows. Now in the story today, there are three pictures I want to give you. First, we will look at an empty flower barrel. Then secondly, we will observe a despairing heart. And thirdly, we will worship a gracious and faithful God. My proposition this morning is this, that God uses an empty flower barrel to bring to complete trust and faith this despairing woman. Now the barrel represents the futility of human resources. They always fail. Ultimately, if you lean upon the arm of flesh, it will fail you. We cannot depend upon man. The Bible says, Cursed is the man that trusteth in the flesh. Our friends will sometimes fail us. We cannot trust any but God. But we can put our faith in Him who never fails. Now, this woman is preparing a last meal. She's going to fix this little cake for her and her son and then they're going to die because there's no more flour. There's no more place to get flour. There's a famine on in the land. And they are going to starve to death. This will be their last meal. And as she's gathering sticks to make a little fire, to prepare that last meal, when she and her son will die, here comes the prophet Elijah. And he says, make me a little cake first. Hope was gone. She was ready to die. They had reached the bottom of the barrel. 
Sometimes the empty barrel of health fades away. Our health dissipates. And we wonder, what can we do? Jesus told a story about a woman who had an issue of blood. She was a bleeder. A hemophiliac. That's a person who bleeds easily. And they cannot staunch the bleeding. And one day Jesus was walking by and she saw Him and she believed that He was the Son of God. And she said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of His garment, I would be healed. And as Jesus passed by, she reached out and she touched the bottom fringe of His garment. Every Jew wore a blue fringe on the bottom of his garment. And that blue fringe was to remind him that his God was in the heavens. And as she saw him and that blue fringe, she said to herself, this is the one from the heavens. This is the one that came down from heaven. If I but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says, immediately virtue went out of him and she was instantly healed. Jesus said, who touched me? Now he knew who touched him. So why did he ask the question? He wanted to elicit an answer from her that she had touched him in faith. That she had become a believer. And he wanted her with all these people there to make this public profession, yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, the One who came down from heaven, born of a virgin, the Son of the living God. He wanted that public confession of her faith. The Bible says that we are to confess the Lord publicly when we become believers. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she fell in her body. She was healed of that plague. She had spent all the money she had. She had been to many doctors and nobody could help her. But when she reached out in faith and touched the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of God went out of Jesus and into her. And that power healed her. And so it is that when a poor sinner reaches out in faith to touch the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, he is healed of sin's disease. He is made whole. Then he should confess publicly, I have become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So sometimes health is an empty barrel. Uh, it goes along, we're happy for years and in good health, and then suddenly health begins to dissipate. The, the barrel becomes empty and we're down to our last bit of health. But we need to take the lesson of this woman. Reach out, touch the Lord, and trust Him that if it be His will, He might heal us. And then, thirdly, there's the empty barrel of finances. It is not unusual that God's people are poor. Most at the time, they are a poor lot of people. You don't find many rich people among the Christians. They are the poor. And Jesus must love the poor because He saves so many of them. I have an illustration I'll use. When I was pastoring a little country church, my first church in New Mexico, a man came into that little community and uh, he was driving a new Ford automobile, but the finance company was looking for him. His name was Uncle Fudd. He used to be on a radio program with Bob Burns. Uh, the older folks might remember him. Bob Burns had a radio show. And he had a, a man on his show named Uncle Fudd. And Uncle Fudd was quite a character. And Uncle Fudd became wealthy. He moved to Los Angeles, bought some hotels, and when prices went up, he sold the hotels, and he became very wealthy. 
But by dissolute living, by spending his money foolishly in drink and carousing, he soon found himself penniless. He got in his car and left Los Angeles and he came as far as this little town of Moriarty, New Mexico. He was out of gas, out of money. The finance company was looking for him to repossess his car and he had nowhere to go and nothing to do. And there he was, stranded in this little community. I found out about his condition and uh, I invited him to come by for a little talk. And he came by the house and uh, he said, Preacher, I've reached the end of my rope. I've reached the bottom of the barrel. He said, I have no money, no friends, no relatives, nowhere to turn. I have lived like a fool. And now he said, I'm paying the price of my foolish life. And he said, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I said, Bud, there's only one you can turn to that can help you. I can't help you because I'm just a preacher and I don't have any money. But I know one that can help you. His name is Jesus. He can help you. I said, would you get down here on your knees beside this couch with me and would you pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? He said, preacher, I will. He said, I've got to have help. And I need somebody. And if Jesus can help me, I'll turn to Him. And He did. He prayed. And I saw the tears trickling down His cheeks. He said, preacher, something's happened to me. He said, I believe Jesus has come into my life. And God touched the hearts of some of the people in that community. They took up an offering for Him and gave Him some money and helped Him to get on His way. Sometimes we reach the point when we can't go any further. We're at the end of our road. We've reached the bottom of the barrel like this poor widow woman. And where can we turn? Fortunately, she could turn to Elijah. And so she did. And we'll find the story as we pick it up. You see, Jesus made a very good promise to us. And here is His promise. He said in Matthew chapter 6, ye cannot serve God and man. That is, if your life's desire is to make money, you're going to fail. You can't serve God and mammon at the same time. You can't have a desire to be wealthy and a desire to serve the Lord at the same time. They're just not very compatible. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to make money. Businessmen have to make money. But the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not evil. It can be used for good purposes. You can buy Bibles with the money. You can help sick people. Money can be used in a good way. But the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Behind every sin, you'll find money involved in some way or other. And Jesus said this, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, Jesus said, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall He not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, 
saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first, notice that word first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God has made a promise to His people. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear or what you're going to drink. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. Don't trust in mammon. Don't trust in money. Don't trust in friends. Don't trust in programs of the government. Trust in me. I will take care of you. That's God's promise. David, the king of Israel, said, I am old and I have been young, and yet I have not seen the Lord's seed begging bread. See, we don't have to beg bread. If we need bread, God will provide our bread. He promised that. He's never broken a promise yet. I, I was just thinking just now about an orphanage home in England run by a man named George Mueller. George Mueller never sent out any kind of a letter for help. And yet he prayed in the food and the money to supply thousands of orphans day by day. One day, the bread was all gone. And it was time for lunch. And Mr. Mueller was told, there's no bread. He went into his little prayer closet, got down on his knees, and he said, Father, these are your little orphans. You love them. And they have no bread. Would you not send some bread, Father, for these little children? He said, thank you, Father, for the bread you're going to send. He got up off his knees and he went out and there at the front door, a man was knocking on the door. He said, Mr. Mueller, I work for the bread company and I have a truckload of bread here to deliver, but the truck is broken down and I can't deliver the bread. Would your orphans like to have this bread? He said, thank you, Lord, for sending the bread. Here was a truckload of bread. The truck broke down right in front of the orphanage. And the man gave the bread to the orphanage. You see, God is a God you can trust. I, I need a God I can trust. I need a God that can help me when I need help. I need a God who will look after me. I need a God whom I can worship. I need a God who loves me and will never let anything happen to me apart from His divine will. I need such a God. And you find in the Lord Jesus Christ that God. He is the God who can take care of His people. Amen. Now notice the test of faith. Now this woman was a believer. But her test was being severely tested. As she was going, verse 11, to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now, to give the last handful of flour to make a cake for Elijah would mean that she and her son would not have anything to eat and that they would die. Now, human reasoning would say it's not fair of Elijah to ask for the last handful of flour and to eat the last cake. It's not fair of Elijah to let my son and I die and him to live. It just isn't right. But you see, Elijah said to her, Fear not. Fear not. You do what I tell you and your 
flour will not fail, the meal will not fail, and the oil, the cruise of oil will not fail until the day that God sends rain upon the earth. She obeyed and did exactly what Elijah told her to do. And she found out that human reasoning cannot stand against the wisdom of God. God tested this woman, tested her faith at a time when it would be the hardest to trust. You know, if the flour barrel was full, wouldn't be any problem to give him a handful of meal to make him a cake. But when it's the last handful and for you to give it to the prophet would mean that the prophet would eat and you would die. God sometimes tests us at a time when it's hard to understand. I think Abraham is an illustration. God had promised Abraham that he would have a son. A son named Isaac. And through Isaac, the Christ would come. Through the lineage of Isaac would come the Lord Jesus Christ. Born of a virgin, of Mary. And Mary was of the lineage of Isaac. And Abraham realized that his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, would someday come through Isaac. And he thought to himself, I better take good care of Isaac. If anything happens to Isaac, if Isaac dies, that cuts off the line the Messiah will come through. And suddenly one morning, early in the morning, he gets a, a call from God. Abraham, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, and take him to the mountain that I will show thee, and offer him there for a burnt offering. That means offer him on a, on a pile of wood and fire and plunge the knife into him and offer him as a sacrifice. And Abraham said, wait a minute. God, you have told us that you're opposed to human sacrifice. And also, if, if I put Isaac to death, if I plunge the knife into him, if I burn him on the altar of sacrifice, I will be cutting off the lineage and the line through which the Savior must come. Lord, you surely cannot mean that. And I've heard some preachers say Abraham walked the floor or early that morning, walked the floor all night, worried. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says early in the morning, Abraham saddled the asses and they took their journey and they went to the Mount of Moriah. The Mount of Moriah is the hill on which Jesus was later crucified. And there Abraham obediently, although he couldn't understand it, he knew that God makes no mistakes. He lays Abraham on the altar, raises the knife, and as he starts to bring the knife down, the angel of the Lord caught his arm and said, Abraham, wait! Now I know that thou lovest me. Look yonder in the thicket. And Abraham looked, and there in a thorn bush was a ram. And it was nibbling on the green leaves of that thorn bush. And it had put its head in the thorn bush. And the thorns had caught it. And it couldn't back out. It was held by those thorns. And God said, you offer the ram instead of Isaac. And you know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of God the Father offering His Son Jesus Christ on the cross. And what did Jesus wear on His head when He went to the cross? They planted a crown of thorns upon his brow. God did not fail Abraham. But he gave him a test of faith. Abraham, will you believe me? 
Do you have the faith to believe that I know what I'm doing? That I do not make mistakes? Even though you can't understand it? Even though you can't comprehend how I could ask you for such a thing? Do you believe me? Do you trust me? Even when you can't understand it? And Abraham did believe and he did trust. And he found out that his trust was not misplaced. It's never misplaced when you put it in God. Isaiah 55 and verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. When the Lord saved me, I realized that I needed God's wisdom. And I realized that if I depended on God's wisdom, I would come out all right. And no matter what I did, if I just depended on the Lord and obeyed Him implicitly, and that was a lesson that I learned early in my Christian life. Trust the Lord even though you don't understand. And sometimes when God tells you to do something, put something on your heart to do, it may run contrary to the wisdom of this world. It may be contrary to the natural thinking of a man. But if God says to do it, do it. You won't go wrong. God makes no mistakes. There are three things that I could say to you about faith this morning. They're all found in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith sees the invisible. The verse says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. These are the ancient pilgrims of God. They saw the promises afar off before the cross, before any of this took place. They saw them afar off. And they embraced them. They believed them. Secondly, faith not only sees the invisible, but faith believes the incredible accounting that God was able to raise him up, speaking of Abraham, from the dead, even whence he received him in a figure. Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Thirdly, faith receives the impossible. Through faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child, that's Isaac, when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now God said, Abraham, you and Sarai are going to have a son. And you will name him Isaac. And he will be the seed line for the Christ to come. And the years rolled by. And Abraham and Sarah were in their late 90s. And Sarah, when the angel of the Lord told her she was going to give birth to Isaac, she laughed, a laugh of unbelief. And the angel said, Wherefore didst thou laugh? Behold, thou shalt see it. And in a few months, this 90-year-old woman gave birth to Isaac. See, when God makes a promise, He always keeps it. He always keeps His promises about judgment. And He always keeps His promises about mercy. If we rely upon them, He'll make them good. Somebody has written, Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by many a foe, that will not tremble on the brink of poverty and woe, that will not murmur nor complain beneath the chastening rod, but in the hour of grief and pain will lean upon its God. Faith that keeps the narrow way till life's last spark hath fled and with a cool and heavenly ray lights up our dying bed. Lord, give me such a faith as this 
that then whatever may come, I even now can taste that bliss of my eternal home. Here is the primacy of faith. God demands that He be first. You'll notice that Elijah says, make me a cake first. God demands that we put Him first in our life. I love my wife very deeply. We were married 52 years when cancer took her home to glory. And I truly loved her And when the Lord saved me, I sat down with her and I had a talk with her. I said, the Lord saved me last night. I'm a Christian now. And I want you to know that with all the love that I have for you, I'm going to have to tell you I love Jesus more than you. I still love you the same, but I love Jesus more. And I want you to know that the rest of my life belongs to Him. I live to please Him. Before I was saved, I lived to please you. Now I live to please Him. She said, I wouldn't want it any other way. He demands that He be first. But He added something to that. Make me a cake first. Then He added to that. And afterward, afterward, make a cake for thee and thy son. Now, human carnal reasoning would have said, hey, there isn't going to be any afterward. We're going to die. But faith said, I will obey. I will believe. And she did. The supremacy of God demands that He be first. God will not play second fiddle in our lives. We must make him number one. Uno numero, as the Spanish would say. True faith always obeys the Word of God. That woman had true faith, and she obeyed the Word of God. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. Then I see the not only the primacy of faith, the obedience of faith, but I see the reward of faith. The reward of faith is to receive. After putting God first, He did three things for her. First, He removed the fear that was in her heart. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He, Jesus, also Himself likewise took part in the same, that through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He removed her fear of death. He promised to supply all of her deeds. The barrel of of meal shall not waste, the cruise of oil shall not fail. This fear of death. Most people are afraid of death. And most people have a, a reason to be afraid of death because they're not saved. And they know they're sinners and they know there's a judgment. I lived in the terrible fear of death as a boy. They told me that when I died, and I'd be put in a hole in the ground and covered up with dirt. And I'd have to stay there until the morning of the resurrection. I didn't like that idea. It never appealed to me. And when I was saved, I read in my Bible, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I said, hallelujah, they'll never put me in a grave in the ground. Never. They may put this tabernacle I live in, this house I live in, they can put it in the grave. I don't mind. I won't be in it. I'll be with Him up there. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
At death, instantly the Christian goes to be with the Lord. His body goes to the ground. His soul goes to be with Jesus. And I remember as a boy how frightened I was at the thought of dying. My little brother and I saw an old vacant car, vacant lot, and an old abandoned junk car sitting over there. We want some gasoline for something. And it was a junk car abandoned over there, so we went over there, and we took a little hose, and I had him hold a little jar, a little can, to get the gas in. And I put the hose down in the gas tank. I didn't know if there was any gas in it. It was an old car abandoned for a long time. But I thought there might be some gas in it. So I began to suck that up. And all of a sudden, I swallowed a big mouthful of that gasoline. And I had heard somewhere that gasoline was poison. And I dropped the hose and I ran to the house. And I said, Mother, Mother, I just swallowed some gasoline. And she looked at me. I said, am I going to die? She said, well, you might. I said, what shall I do? I thought she'd rush me to the hospital. Well, she said, I don't know. You're in a bad way. She said, you won't drink your milk anymore like we asked you. You didn't chop up your kindling this morning. And she said, you just don't do anything we want you to do. She said, you're in bad shape. I don't know what's going to become of you. I didn't know what to say. I ran upstairs and I got my little Bible they gave me in Sunday school. And I opened it up and I read that a living dog is better than a dead lion. That didn't help me much. I didn't have any knowledge of God except the fear of God. And I lived in that fear until the night God saved me. When Jesus came into my heart, He took all that fear away. I'm not afraid of it anymore. It doesn't bother me. I know where I'm going. I know how I'm going. God's going to take care of me. I'll never go into a grave. You won't either. Did you know that? You will never be put in a grave. You will either go to heaven or to hell. But you'll never go into a grave. All that go into the grave is your body. And He removes the fear of death. When Jesus comes in, fear goes out. This woman was a great woman in Israel. And it was her privilege to serve the prophet and obey the Lord. And as God through these many Bible illustrations shows us that He tests our faith. And He will. If you have faith in the Lord, God will test your faith. Not because He doesn't know if your faith is real or not, but He wants you to know that your faith is real. And by testing your faith, you come to the place where you know that your faith is real saving faith. It's the genuine article. Let's stand together, please, and sing our invitation verse. If there's one here this morning who never professed Christ as Savior and Lord, we invite you to do that this morning. If you're here and you'd like to become a member of Trinity Baptist Church, you just come as we sing. Number 26. It's in the bulletin, I believe, isn't it? All right. 26 in the book. Just as I am without one foot.
together be dismissed in prayer. Brother Jim, would you dismiss it?